Okay, I always like real quick, where are we, where we've been? Now in 1 John, the Apostle John, he writes to instruct, warn, and encourage faithful Christians in the region around Ephesus, probably, but he writes to instruct and, and warn and encourage those Christians in response to the rise and influence of certain false teachers that have gone out. The letter's written probably in the early 90s, and in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we looked at last week, John stresses that in contrast to the false teachers, that his message is the authentic original message. It doesn't rest on lofty speculation, but on the personal, first-hand knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that was common, shared by the apostles. And in verse 2, John affirms the incarnation, the fact that the eternal life that was with the Father was manifested in the historical person Jesus of Nazareth. He'll say this a number of times because this is one of the issues but he, he acknowledges or asserts the incarnation. In verse 3, he explains that the apostles, as represented by him, that they proclaim to the readers what they saw in and heard from the Lord Jesus so that his readers might have fellowship with them, might share in the spiritual bond of the family of God. So salvation and thus fellowship is a product of accepting or abiding in the truth, in the true message about Jesus Christ, as opposed to the message that these false teachers are trying to get the faithful ones to swallow. John says in verse 4 that his joy would be diminished if they would wander from the faith, wander out of salvation and thus out of fellowship. Then in chapter 1, verse 5, John says that the message the apostles heard from Jesus and what they through John proclaimed to John's readers is that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Now this axiom, as I mentioned last week, this axiom is, is a foundational aspect of Christ's message. Because you look at that and say, what is this? This is what we heard from him. He's saying, how is this connected? Well, it's a foundational aspect of Christ's message because it's the basis of our alienation from God. It is the reason we're in need of the reconciliation that God provides. See, Christ's healing work, that work cannot be understood without some understanding that sin separates us from God and thus puts us in need of that healing. You see, it's a foundational kind of thing. Sin separates us from God because God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And then in chapter 1, verses 6 through chapter 2, verse 6, John fleshes out the ethical implications of this statement that he's made of the truth that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. And when we ended last week, and let's see what that's putting up here. I got something over. I got two things here. When we ended last week, we were looking at uh, verses 6 through 10 of chapter 1, and there... In verse 6, John's referring to the false teachers. He says that, look, those who, who claim that they have fellowship with God, that claim is falsified. It is shown to be untrue if those making the claim live in sin, if they conduct themselves without an awareness of or regard for the will of God. I don't care what they say, you see. If they are making that claim, that claim is shown to be false if they are walking in darkness, if they are living in sin. Now, right when we ended, I just started commenting on verse 7. I might repeat a bit of what I said there, but I'm going to pick back up there in verse 7, and then we'll carry on. He says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his Son cleanses us from all sin. See, in contrast to the false teachers who lie, by claiming that they have fellowship with God while walking in the darkness, while not doing the truth, in contrast to them, those who walk in the light have fellowship with one another and receive an ongoing cleansing of all their sin through Jesus' death on the cross. That's this idea of fellowship with one another through the blood of Jesus' 
The blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us. Those who walk in the light in contrast to those who lie about their relationship and walk in the darkness, those who walk in the light have fellowship with one another and ongoing cleansing of, of sin. Now that walking in the light refers to conducting oneself ethically or morally. I say this because sometimes question, well, what does walking in the light mean? Okay, well, I'm telling you what it means is that it, it involves conducting oneself ethically or morally. It has ethical and moral connotations, how a person lives. And you can see that from the fact it's contrasted to walking in darkness. You see, those who claim a relationship with God but walk in darkness lie. But if we walk in the light, and I argued last week, that walking in the darkness has ethical connotations. It means living in sin. So the contrast alone shows you that walking in the light has ethical implications. But you can also see it in 1 John 2, uh, 5 and 6. He says, by this we know we are in him. The one who claims to abide in him ought himself to walk just as that one walked. Now there you see it clearly walking as Jesus walked. Taking his path living in accordance with his life. And so you can see the ethical implications there, and you also see it quite clearly in Ephesians chapter 5. This is the same thing Paul is saying. In Ephesians 5 and 7 to 9, he says, Therefore do not be sharers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So this idea of those who walk in the light, it is those who are conducting themselves righteously, who are walking in accordance with Jesus' walk, who are living in that way, in that path. Now verse 7, verse 7 makes clear, as, as do the following verses in verse 8 and verse 10, and in chapter 2, verse 1, that walking in the light does not mean living sinlessly. That is not what walking in the light means. It's clear from verse 7, verse 8, verse 10, and chapter 2, verse 1. On the contrary, if we claim to be without sin, he says in verse 8 and verse 10, we deceive ourselves. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, which is what the false teachers were doing. Walking in the light means that our lives will not be characterized by disobedience. They won't be characterized by disobedience. It means our sins will be in the context of an overall surrender to the will of God. And because of that, when we sin, we will confess those sins and we will renounce those sins when we recognize them. The one who walks in darkness is the one who has accepted his sin. The one who has made peace with his sin. That person's not interested in bringing his life in line with the will of God. Now, of course, individuals vary in how successfully they live out this commitment to obey, but that's different from not having the commitment. And I oftentimes tell people, you understand the notion of a commitment in terms of your spouse, or you have maintained that commitment, but you have not flawlessly executed it, have you? No, you haven't. But you understand there's a difference between that and failing within the context of that overarching commitment and rejecting the commitment itself. Matt Walsh, who's a Christian blogger, just this last Friday, he wrote this. He says, it's one thing to sin. It's another to say that sinning is not sinful. It's one thing to disobey the commandments. It's another to categorically reject the authority of the commandments. It's one thing to crawl back to God and beg for forgiveness. It's another to stand there and say you don't need forgiveness because God was wrong when he called your sin a sin. It's one thing to follow Christian teachings imperfectly. It's another to loudly denounce them. It's one thing to fall short of the faith. It's another to change the faith to suit you. See, do you, I mean, do you see the difference? Do you see the, the concept? And I think it's very important, and it'll come up uh, again and again. Now, it seems obedience has gotten a bad name in the church. Now, this is my judgment. This is my perception. 
It seems obedience has gotten a bad name in the church. If you speak these days, as John speaks here and elsewhere, if you say boldly that those who walk in darkness, who live in sin, will not be saved, regardless of whether they claim to have faith in Christ, in some quarters you will be labeled a legalist or an enemy of grace. Now, those who think that way, they have succumbed to an unbiblical view that reduces faith to mere mental assent to a truth or to a proposition, rather than seeing faith as a wholehearted surrender to the Lord who is the object of that faith. You see, that's, that's the key. You see, in the terminology of James... Chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, they have mistaken dead faith for the faith that saves. And there is a difference between those. Now, I'm certainly not alone in thinking that obedience has fallen on hard times. The New Testament scholar Gary Burge, he says, Many of us recoil at the mere word obedience. I often meet students who have grown up in conservative churches and families where obedience and righteousness were pounded home so often that today they've been pushed aside as vehicles of death and suffocation. Obey, such students ask. God loves me. Let me simply enjoy Him and live. For some of us, promoting obedience is difficult, particularly when we ground our salvation in the rich goodness and charity of God. Nevertheless, John could not be clearer. And I agree with that. I mean, John is perfectly clear in what he's saying. Burge continues, Sometimes I wonder if our concern to support the Reformation teaching about grace has sabotaged any hope for this call to obedience. We frame the theology of the New Testament as a series of juxtapositions. The synagogue versus the church. Jesus versus Moses. Paul versus Jerusalem legalists. Grace versus law. In doing so, we forget that Paul's first concern with works of Jewish ritual that were thought to earn some benefit from God. Paul can at once say that the Christian life should display good works and yet say that we are not saved by works. See, that's an important thing. Paul endorsed no compromise to the believer's pursuit of righteousness. The same is true of Jesus. This is a difficult paradox. Personal righteousness and obedience are an essential component of our faith, yet do not form the basis of our salvation. See, that's what has to get, get across and be understood. And I think that it, you, know, you wind up seeing this just happens in churches. The idea of calling people to holiness and obedience, no, we don't want to do that. People don't want to hear that. Well, I don't care if they want to hear it. It's the truth. Now, John MacArthur, who's a well-known evangelical preacher, he wrote in his book almost 30 years ago, his book titled The Gospel According to Jesus, he said, the gospel in vogue today holds forth a false hope to sinners. It promises them that they can have eternal life yet continue to live in rebellion against God. Indeed, it encourages people to claim Jesus as Savior yet defer until later the commitment to obey Him as Lord. It promises salvation from hell, but not necessarily freedom from iniquity. It offers false security to people who revel in the sins of the flesh and spurn the way of holiness. By separating faith from faithfulness, it leaves the impression that intellectual assent is as valid as wholehearted obedience to the truth. Thus, the good news of Christ has given way to the bad news of an insidious, easy believism that makes no moral demands on the lives of sinners. It is not the same message Jesus proclaimed. And I think that's exactly right. Now, I'm afraid that until we expect and insist on holiness from our brothers and sisters, until that is what we expect and insist on from our brothers and sisters, that the church will not be the beacon that God intends it to be, and it will fall prey to trying to attract and keep people with superficialities. That is what I see going on all over the place. Instead of the church being this beacon 
of a called out people who live differently, who live sanctified lives, who are a true fellowship, people who are zealous for God. That is the light. And instead of that, we don't want to call people to holiness. And instead, we want to attract people with junk. Oh, maybe if we did this, maybe if we did that, maybe we painted the walls a different color. All of those superficialities, I think, undermine something important. A world that is mired in sin, that is enslaved to sin, needs to know. In the words of that, the famous hymn, Rock of Ages, needs to know that Christ is sin's double cure see he sins doubles double cure he cleanses from sin's guilt and power the world needs to know that as i've said many times a christian is not the same person in a new situation is not simply the same person who's now been transferred forensically Same person, but now just in a different situation of being forgiven. A Christian is a new person in a new situation. And that's important to understand. Now, you remember that John is writing. When I tell you at the beginning that these are occasional documents, John is writing to a specific group of Christians in a specific situation. He's not writing a general tract on how to be saved. He's writing to people you see who already were saved, and he's trying to keep them that way by encouraging them and warning them about the false teachers who are threatening them. And you have to recognize that. See, things like the necessity of baptism, they weren't an issue. So if you just parachute in and say, but if we walk in the light, if somebody is just proceeding this way, that's all that matters. Well, then if you take John out of his theological context, it just creates havoc. That's why it's important, I think, to understand something of the context in which these letters are written. Now, it's interesting that John says that a consequence of faithful living is fellowship with one another. You see, we have fellowship with one another. The false teachers, they boasted about their fellowship with God, but they didn't say a whole lot about their fellowship with men. And more specifically, they didn't say anything about their fellowship with faithful Christians. You remember that they had seceded from the faithful Christians, and apparently are showing little, if any, brotherly love toward Christians. John's faithful. And John is saying here that if you walk in the light, you have fellowship with one another. He wants to remind his readers, and they're through that to remind us, that they cannot have fellowship with God without having fellowship with other Christians. It is a package deal. You see, if, you are, if you're in fellowship with God, you are in fellowship with all who are in fellowship with God. That's just part of the case. So it doesn't matter. See, and that's part of the power of the church is how it transcends all of these cultural differences. It overrides nationality, race, you name it, social strata. What matters is the bond that we share because we are united to God in Christ. And that's the testimony of the community of faith. As people look around in a world that's ripped by division, all these things, they see, well, how is it that all of these different people, Jew, Greek, Gentile, on and on, how is it that all these people are living in harmony and loving one another and committed to one another, transcending all of those differences is because their fellowship is with one another because they are in fellowship with God. And so he wants them to understand that. He says in verse 8, if we say that we do not have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now here he's refuting another of the false teacher's claims based on this idea of to have sin. If we say that we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, what's he mean by that? Well, based on, on the way John uses this phrase, to have sin, Elsewhere, he uses it in the Gospel of John in a number of places that I'll cite to you in a minute. It seems that what he means, he's warning people who have sinned that they cannot claim we are free from the guilt of sin. We're not guilty. He says anybody who thinks that or who claims that is deceiving themselves. In fact, the English Standard Version translates the phrase to have sin in John chapter 9 and chapter 15, as have guilt and be guilty of sin. And in John chapter 19, verse 11, it clearly refers to having committed a sinful act. Here's what Colin Cruz 
says about this. He says, the expression to have sin is found only here in 1 John, but it occurs four times in the fourth gospel, John 9, 41, 15, 22, and 24, and 19, 11. And in each case, it means to be guilty of sins. Allowing this usage to guide us, we would have to say that what the secessionists, the false teachers, those who've gone out from them and who are now turned against them, he says what the secessionists were claiming was not that they were by nature free from the sin principle, but they were, they were not guilty of committing sins, by which they probably meant they had not sinned since they came to know God and experienced the anointing. You see, as I've, as I've uh, indicated, perhaps they got there, perhaps they got there by thinking that wrong actions, you see, were irrelevant, particularly after enlightenment. What I do trapped in this worthless dross, this body, this material thing, what I do with my body and how I conduct myself is irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. Well, perhaps they got that way thinking, that, look, after all that matters is my enlightenment and my liberation of the spark, the spirit, the non-material, the liberation of that from this prison of the evil material world. That's what matters. How I conduct myself here, perhaps that's what's behind that. And the slide I just put up there, Irenaeus says of Carpocrates, who was a second century heretic. Irenaeus says of him that Carpocrates claimed there were, there were no wrong actions for the enlightened. You see, if that strikes you as crazy, well, this is the late first century. Just in the second century, you see evidence of exactly this kind of thinking where he says, there were no wrong actions for the enlightened and urged wicked deeds with impunity as a way of showing one's freedom from the powers that rule the world. This guy's idea is, look, what I do here is meaningless, and I'm going to stick it in your eye, powers, by showing that what you have control over is worthless, so I'm going to sin like crazy. You see, so you wonder, how could these ideas take traction? And you can see that happening uh, you can see it taking place in things like that. Now, John's reply is simply that those who say that, those who say they're not guilty of sin, they're deceiving themselves and the truth isn't in them. He just says that. They're deceiving themselves and the truth isn't in them. Denying that sinful conduct is indeed sinful. That is to denigrate the absolutely holy God who is the standard by which sinfulness is judged, and it is to misjudge the depth of our need for grace. Those who do that, those who deny that they are guilty of sin, deny their sins, they do, those who do that, they don't have the truth in them in the sense the truth has not been internalized. The truth has not taken control of their thinking. If it had, they would be conscious of their sin. If the truth had really gotten hold of them and they had internalized it and it was controlling their thinking, there's no way in the world they could think that they were free of sin and not guilty of sin. Let me read you a quote with John Piper. John Piper says, In this life, we never get beyond the awareness of remaining sin. Therefore, one of the great signs of maturity in Christ is a deep and abiding brokenness for sin. There's much talk today about esteeming ourselves as new creatures in Christ, and so we are. But our newness consists in this, that the true light is shining in our hearts, revealing the dreadfulness of our remaining sin and the abundance of God's grace. Our great joy is that our sin is forgiven in Christ, and our great grief is that so much of this very sin remains and defiles. The mark of a new creature in Christ is not a rosy self-concept. It is brokenness for remaining sin mingled with a joyful confidence in the superabounding grace of God in Christ. And I think that's important to see. This idea of, you know, no, 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 there's nothing here. There's nothing going on in my life. And this notion of just looking at sin that way and winding up and trivializing it is, is something that, is bad, our confidence in the amazing grace of God. Absolutely amazing. 
But our confidence in the amazing grace of God must never lead us to trivialize sin. We cannot do that. Trivialize sin. Mercy certainly is ours in Christ. But we must hold that truth with the truth that sin is monstrous. Sin is monstrous. It's the very thing for which our Lord suffered. And that awareness, you see, that keeps us humble before the Lord, mindful of our utter and absolute lack and appreciative of his incomparable greatness. You see, those things have to be held together. And if they do, then I think that functions in building Christian maturity. That's something I think we need to hold on to. Now, the temptation to deny one's sin, that's common, right? I mean, that's something that's common. It's unpleasant to face ourselves in our sin, so we construct ways to deny it. I mean, who wants to see ourselves in our sin? It's uncomfortable. We hate it. So we do construct these ways to deny it. Now, our ways tend not to be as theologically complex as those of John's opponents, but the effect is the same. We redefine sin so as to exclude the conduct in which we're engaging. Don't you see that happening all in our world? Homosexual conduct, that's not sinful. You say, what? No, 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 that's not sinful. You know, you pick it. Sleeping together, sexual immorality, fornication, that's not sinful. We love each other. And on and on. And we just, we tend to redefine as not sinful the things in which we're engaged. We do that and we also trivialize sin in the name of grace. The idea that sin doesn't matter now because Christ died for them. Why are you hung up on that? Why are you keeping, why are you still talking about that? We've been freed, we've been forgiven, now forget it. Okay, and you see how there's elements of truth in that. What I'm saying to you is you cannot trivialize sin because of the mercy of God. You have to hold those things together and recognize that the sin that still abides in me is monstrous and awful, and it is the thing for which my Lord died. And we have to recognize that. I've told some of you this story about the the frontier settlement in the West where the the people, they were engaged in the lumbering business, and the town wanted a church. They built a church building. They hired a preacher. And the preacher had been there just several months when he noticed some members of the congregation. They were going out, and and the town upstream had put logs in the river. And as they came down, he saw his congregants intercepting the logs that the town upstream had floated down the river, sawing off that town's brand, putting on their own brand, and then sending them down. It's like cattle rustling, but with logs. So he recognizes that, and then, you know, he's bothered by that, and he preaches a sermon the next Sunday on on the text, Thou shalt not steal. And that Sunday, they all came up, you know, everybody lined up, thanked him and all that, and everything was fine. And then the next day, he goes out and he sees the congregants still stealing the logs. So he's really bothered by this, and then he goes, and the next Sunday, he preaches a sermon on, Thou shalt not saw off the brands of thy neighbor's logs. (laughs) And at the close of that service, they ran him out of town. You see, but I, you see this idea of wanting to construct things and hide from our sin and deny our sin. And it's even, it, it comes in, you say, listen, you don't want to talk this way because people don't want to hear that. People from the outside want to come in and want to hear about how to live a great life and all this stuff. You don't want to talk about sin and what it does and how horrible it is because you sound like you're fire and brimstone. What I want to be is textual. That's what I want to be, textual. This is what John is talking about, what John is saying. John says in verse verse 9, he says, But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, so that he forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now here you see the reference to sins is plural. Okay, if we have sin, here he says if we confess our sins, that indicates that John's speaking of sinful acts. See, rather than a general propensity or condition, and the fact it's contrasted with if we do not have sin, but if we confess our sins, you see, that reinforces the view that we do not have sin, 
that we're on the right track, that that does in fact refer to being guilty of sinning. Instead of saying we do not have sin, we are to admit that we commit sins. That is, that is what we're to do. Now, the proper Christian attitude towards sins is not to deny them. It is not to deny sin, to hide sin, to walk and continue in sin. That is not the pr proper Christian attitude. The proper Christian attitude is to confess them. As I. Howard Marshall says, to confess our sins is not merely to admit we're sinners, just kind of some kind of general idea, yes, 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 I'm a general sinner, but to lay them before God and to seek forgiveness. Specifically. This is what confession is about. According to the German scholar, Ottfried Hofius, in the Exegetical Dictionary of the New Testament, he says the intention is not only an inner admission, but also an open confession of sins before God. The author of 1 John shares with ancient Judaism both the conviction that confession of sins is the precondition for God's forgiveness and the certainty that God responds to confession of sin with the comfort of forgiveness. See, confession, that's the expression of a penitent heart. That's what confession is. It's not somebody who's denying and hiding and walking. When you say you confess sins, it's not that I just am acknowledging them before you, but I'm not repenting of them. Of course not. Confession carries the sense that I am acknowledging them, them before you as my wrongs. You see, I, I'm acknowledging them before you as my wrongs. It's the reaction to sin of one who is walking in the light. This is how one does. It's the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us of our debts slash sins. Forgive us our debts slash sins. It's the Lord's prayer applied to concrete cases. If we confess our sins rather than insist on continuing in them, or yes, 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 I know this is wrong, but I don't care. This is my little part here. I've done all this for the Lord. I'm doing this, but I'm going to harbor this sin. I'm going to shield pornography from him. He can have these other things, but this is part of who I am. I'm going to shield this and walk in this, and I'm not going to confess this and repent of this. Well, see, that's not, that's not right. That's something, you see, that when we confess our sins, we need to confess them, to repent of them, acknowledge them, instead of continuing in them. And if we do that, then we receive God's forgiveness and cleansing. That's the promise. As we confess our sins, we are walking in the light. We are people who are tuned into God. We have a commitment to Him. We fail to flawlessly perform that commitment. But when it comes to our attention, we have failed. What do we do? We don't say, too bad, I'm holding on to this. We come to God and what? We confess. We renounce. We repent. And what's God's response? Forgiveness. Cleansing. Forgiveness. Cleansing. So I said, there's, to me, there's just no greater promise than this. Now, notice that John, he speaks of sins both as a debt to be forgiven and as a stain to be cleansed. And sin is indeed both. You see, it's a debt in that in sinning, we have denied God something he is due. That's how sin is a debt. We've denied him something that is due. And it's something that stains us before him. It defiles us. So he says that our sins are forgiven... And we are cleansed of our unrighteousness. So, I mean, it, it, to me, it's just a wonderful thing. And in forgiving our sins and in cleansing our unrighteousness, he says that God is both faithful and just. He's faithful in doing that because he's promised to forgive and cleanse. So he's faithful to that. And he's just in doing that either because it's just or right to honor one's promise, which is certainly true, and or... Because the death of his son has provided for a just forgiveness. You see, that's the whole idea that God in forgiving us, in his son, he has, he has given us a way that he can forgive in keeping with his nature. He is loving and merciful and he's holy and just. So how does he express both of those? He does it in the cross of Christ where he does not trivialize sin. He does not wink at sin, but he provides a means 
by which he can forgive that is consistent with his whole being. And so maybe that's the idea. You see that he, he but in, in his doing that, he is faithful and just. And he says, if, if, if we say we've not sinned, if we say that we make him a liar and his word is not in us in verse 10, in verse 8, John quoted the false teacher's claims, we do not have sin, present tense. If we say we do not have sin. Here he uses perfect. Here he quotes their claim, we have not sinned. Now, some people think there's a difference, material difference between these two claims, but I'm not one of those. With Colin Cruz and a number of other people, I think the essential meaning is the same. And I think John repeats here, he repeats the claim of verse 10 in different words to make the point that those who say that, they not only deceive themselves, but they actually make God a liar. They're not just deceiving themselves. They're calling God a liar in that, and they call God a liar because they're denying his declaration that all people are sinners. God has revealed this, and they're saying, ain't so. And so they're calling God a liar. Marshall says Paul's statement, all have sinned in Romans 3.23, is no isolated remark. It sums up the teaching of Scripture on the universality of sin. And that's certainly true. Indeed, this, that teaching's implicit in 1 John 4.10, where he says God sent his Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, for our sins. And because they contradict God's testimony, in denying their sin. They, they contradict his testimony on that matter. It's clear that his word is not in them. They haven't internalized it. They haven't accepted it. And you see a parallel to this idea in John chapter 5, verses 38 and, 37 and 38, where Jesus says that their refusal to believe in the one God sent shows what? Shows that his word does not dwell in them. Well, they haven't internalized it. Have they read it? Yeah, they read it. Have they seen it? Yeah, they saw it. But they hadn't internalized it. That word, because if they had, then they wouldn't have refused to believe in the one God sent. And I think it's the same sense that's being said here. All right, chapter 2. Chapter 2, 1 and 2, he says, My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, John doesn't want his comments emphasizing the fact Christians are guilty of sin and that they receive ongoing forgiveness. He doesn't want his comments about that to be misinterpreted as a license to sin or a reason to be casual about sin. Paul faced the same idea. You remember Romans chapter 6, verse 1, where he says, What then shall we say? Should we continue in sin so grace may increase? He wants to make sure that in talking about the ongoing forgiveness that he's talked about, that nobody takes that and misunderstands that as a license to sin or a reason to be casual about sinning. The goal must be to live without sin, as he emphasized in verses 6 and 7, and the fact we don't succeed cannot be allowed to invalidate the goal. The goal is to live sinlessly. That is how God calls us. That is what he wants us to be. We do not. But that doesn't mean that's not the goal. This is the note that I think the church has become too reluctant to sound. This is just my view of it. I think the church has become too reluctant to sound this. We have in too many cases swallowed the notion that boldly calling people not to sin, calling them to holiness of life, is contrary to the truth that our standing with God is a gift that is not gained by our work or obedience. We've somehow pitted these two against each other. The idea has taken root that calling people to a radical holiness is done at the expense of proclaiming God's grace. And the result of that false conflict, the result of that false conflict is to understate the horror of sin. 
See, which is, I, I fear, has caused some not to take sin as seriously as they should. Now, we need to be clear, always sounding, that salvation is by grace, through faith, not by works, but we also need to be clear that sin is a grave matter. Okay? We have to have both of those things. He says, in, in, he says but if anyone does sin, he says, the things that I'm saying to you, I write these so that you may not sin. I don't want you to understand me to be advocating a casualness about sin. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not, only, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, though God's call to us, his call is that we not sin. When we do sin, as verse 8 and verse 10 makes clear that we will, if we will confess that sin, as said in verse 9, rather than denying it and continuing to walk in it, to live in it, we can rest assured that we're forgiven. We can rest assured that we're forgiven. Now, what a promise. And the power of that promise is seen even more clearly if you substitute specific sins. You see, that's when you can really see the power of it. He says, I write these things that you may not sin, but if anyone does get drunk, but if anyone does steal, but if anyone does fornicate, does curse, does commit adultery, does engage in homosexual conduct, does hate, does lie, on and on and on. But if anyone does, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see the power in that? What that does for people who have fallen so much that they disgust themselves to understand that the door to God is always open because the advocate that you have, anyone he represents, is right with God. You see, that's what's important. That's what's important, that assurance of forgiveness, see? That assurance of forgiveness, it stems, stems from the fact that our advocate with the Father is Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the one who represents us. He's the one who died for us in obedience to and in fulfillment of God's plan. No one he represents is condemned. If he comes representing you, Nobody he represents is condemned. Now, the fact the Father sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice, as John says in chapter 4, verse 10, means we, we cannot have this idea, and we cannot think that Jesus has to overcome some kind of reluctance on the part of the Father to forgive. Sometimes that's how we view it, is that here's Jesus, he's the good guy, and he's got to go and persuade this angry, mean guy to forgive us. That's crazy. Okay, that's completely crazy. It's clear from Romans 3, 21 to 26, that God initiated this sacrifice of his son, this outpouring of wrath, so that he might be able to forgive consistently with his holiness. He's not being persuaded to forgive, as though he's somehow reluctant to do it. He provided the way to forgive consistently with his nature. He's not being talked into anything. You see, I mean, Christ's advocacy on our behalf, it's not a matter of persuasion. That's not what it's about, but an expression of the very plan of the Father. He represents us in the blood of his sacrifice. Charles Wesley's hymn, Arise, My Soul, Arise. I don't know that we even sing this here, but it's a great song. He says part of it. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands, my name is written on his hands. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all-redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood atoned for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. You see, that's the representation. That's the advocacy. And as we walk in the light and are with him, and as we confess the sins, you see, I write these things so that you may not sin, but anyone who does sin, 
anyone who does, whatever it is, I'm telling you, whatever it is, the way is open to God. I've said many times, I don't care how ugly it is, how ashamed you are, how long you've been trapped in it, the way to God is open because we have such a magnificent Savior. I heard the bell. Thanks.